What is Bitcoin and its relevance to the world financial system today? Today I'm going to give you the beginner's guide to Bitcoin. Stay tuned. How do I bring my faith to work? How do I tap into the power of God in my work-life call? Why am I going through this adversity? Is God mad at me? I'm Oz Hillman, and I've been helping leaders like you answer these questions and more for over 30 years. That's what this podcast is all about. Let's learn and grow together. Welcome to TGIF. Today, God is first. Recently, I read a book called Thank God for Bitcoin, The Creation, Corruption, and Redemption of Money. I found the book very uh, interesting. It's written by several Christian authors, and uh, the primary part of the book deals with the history of money and the, the corruption of money and how it corrupts systems and so forth. But in chapter 8, it talks about Bitcoin, and it's one of the best chapters I've ever read on understanding what Bitcoin is and what it isn't. I'm going to share this portion of the book with you today, and maybe you don't know anything about Bitcoin, and uh, this is going to be for you. It will give you the straight-up answers on why we should be looking at Bitcoin and uh, its relevance to the financial systems in the world today. It's been said that you can judge the importance of an idea by the vehemence of its opposition. In the 11 years since its inception, Bitcoin has been called many things. A scam, a fad, tulip mania 2.0, the MySpace of money, the Model T of cryptocurrencies, libertarian idealism, magic, internet money, the biggest bubble in history. But in the context of the history of money, Bitcoin is a giant leap forward. Bitcoin is a form of money that is new in substance, security, and transparency. More importantly, Bitcoin is both a leap forward in the technology of money and a return to moral money. In chapter 1, we mentioned that money is a tool and that tools never emerge out of a vacuum. Tools always arise as a special or specific response to a particular problem or need. Bitcoin is no different. At Bitcoin's inception, anonymous creator Satoshi Nakamoto included a message that read as follows. The Times, 03 January 2009, Chancellor on Brink of Second Bailout for Banks, unquote. Satoshi's words were written in the context of the great financial crisis of 2008. They were directly referencing the carnage and injustice that the modern economic system had unleashed on millions of people. When the dust settled, $5 trillion worth of pension money, real estate value, bonds, 401ks, and savings went up in smoke. Several hundred thousand hours of work disappeared in a few weeks. In the U.S. alone, millions lost their homes and millions lost their jobs. Meanwhile, the banks and politicians that intentionally allowed and personally benefited from the morally bankrupt system received millions of dollars in bonuses. In the wake of 2008's economic destruction, Bitcoin is showing the world there is a better way. Bitcoin was created to redeem the good aspects of modern money while restoring money to its original goal, serving and helping mankind and not destroying it. The free market creation of money settled on gold as its optimal tool, but gold was ultimately corrupted by central banking. Bitcoin has be, has a potential to serve as the redemption of money. Some have tried to downplay the significance of Satoshi's message, but when you look more closely at what Bitcoin does, then Satoshi's condemnation of the current monetary order becomes difficult to deny. In other words, getting rid of the corruption of the current monetary system was part of Bitcoin's design and purpose. In this chapter, we lay out what Bitcoin is and why it's particularly suited to redeem the corrupt monetary system. An alternative to bad money. 
Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Romans 6.16 6, We cannot understand Bitcoin's significance without understanding that our money is broken. It's much easier to grasp a thing's importance after understanding the need it fulfills. This is why many people remain uninterested in Bitcoin. They don't realize there's a problem to be fixed. The previous chapters focused on the problems of the current monetary order. We showed that the monetary systems we live under are at best naive and at worst based on lies and theft. As we've discussed throughout the book, bad money enables theft, corruption, laziness, and intemperate behavior. More importantly, bad money tempts us to worship money. If bad money is at the root of these problems, good money, or a money that incentivizes moral behavior, is what we should turn to. Before we continue this chapter, keep in mind that this book is focused on the moral consequences of Bitcoin. Therefore, we won't be addressing the technical aspects in detail. If you're interested in those details, the resources section at the end of this book offers plenty of places to learn about Bitcoin. Note that learning about an entirely new monetary system is not a small undertaking and will require some time and effort to understand. For the rest of this chapter, we'll describe the properties of Bitcoin and their moral consequences. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is money that is digital, decentralized, and scarce. Bitcoin is digital as opposed to physical, meaning it is native to computers. You won't find a physical Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be sent directly to someone else, much like handling an envelope of physical cash to a friend except over the internet. Bitcoin is also decentralized. Bitcoin does not come from nor is it controlled by a centralized source. This is because Bitcoin does not need a trusted authority to function. There is no bank or credit card company that acts as an intermediary. Bitcoin is built on 100% verification and 0% trust. Digital and decentralized might not seem like much at first, but believe it or not, that specific combination did not exist for money until 2009 when Bitcoin was introduced. Lastly, Bitcoin is perfectly scarce, having 21 million unit limit. There can never be any more than 21 million Bitcoin. We'll explore how this is enforced later in this chapter, but first, let's look at the problem that Bitcoin solves. The problem of trust. Do not trust in princes and mortal men in whom there is no salvation, Psalm 146, 3. Computers and the internet have made a lot of things in the world much more efficient. They have enabled us to shop from home, communicate with people from across the globe, and follow events from every, anywhere. This is in part because digital objects are extremely convenient. Unlike physical objects, digital objects can be copied perfectly and near instantaneously. For example, making a copy of a book in digital form is significantly faster and easier than making a copy of a book in a physical form. Digital objects are easy to copy, and that's a big problem if we want to limit the quantity of digital objects. For instance, when you send an email, you are actually sending a copy as you still have the email in your sent folder. Similar problems exist with music and movie files. Until Bitcoin, the only way to limit the quantity of digital objects was to designate an authority. For instance, if you buy a book for your Kindle, Amazon keeps track of the fact that you paid and gives you access to the book. Amazon, in this case, is considered the trusted authority between you and the publisher of that book. The existence of a trusted authority makes the exchange much easier. In our case, both you and the publisher can trust Amazon. Otherwise, the publisher would have to set up their own credit card fraud department and e-reader system, and you would have to evaluate the publisher's legitimacy and solvency. Given how popular Amazon is, there's a good chance that 
You and the publisher have trust relationships with Amazon already, making the transaction less prone to fraud on both sides. Unfortunately, trusted authorities like Amazon add their own problems. For example, if Amazon decides to take away your book, they can. This is no theoretical problem. They have done this in the past with books they decided they no longer wanted on that platform. If Amazon deletes your account, you may not have access to anything digital you bought from them. Technically, you don't really own your digital book as much as you have access to the book with Amazon's permission. In other words, the trusted authority has its own chance to commit fraud. The U.S. dollar operates the same way. The trusted authority may be your bank, Visa, PayPal, the Fed, or any number of financial intermediaries. We don't really own the money in those accounts. We just have access to the money with the trusted authority's permission. For example, many credit cards will not allow you to buy expensive sneakers allowed by gasoline within a 30-minute window. Why? Many stolen credit cards have the specific pattern of buying those two items, so buying them in that order is prohibited. Trusted authorities can be problematic because they can abuse their power. Anyone who has to deal with getting money to missionaries in foreign countries knows how difficult that can be. This is in large part because of the many intermediaries that the money has to go through. As most money in the world today is moved digitally, the trusted authorities have an outsized say in who gets to move money around and who doesn't. In many instances, these trusted authorities steal from these transactions either by demanding bribes or by adding extra fees. Solving Trust Bitcoin removes the need for a trusted authority. Bitcoin can be transferred directly, much like exchanging physical cash but done over the internet. A trusted authority is not needed because there is complete record of every transaction that anyone can download. This ledger is called the blockchain, and anyone can check for transactions directly. Using cryptography, Any computer or cell phone can verify the legitimacy of any transaction. Unlike a silver piece that's been debased or a gold coin that's been clipped or a $100 bill that's been counterfeited, Bitcoin is extremely difficult to fake. Its authenticity can be checked quickly and easily on a low-end mobile phone. Because Bitcoin is also easy to verify, it's less susceptible to fraud like counterfeiting. Unlike the arbiters of the financial system, Bitcoin cannot be bribed. In other words, Bitcoin makes transactions much easier to trust and is thus a more moral alternative. The problem of inflation. Proverbs 28.20 says, A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. We covered in chapter 3 that fiat money's main problem is that its supply can be inflated to oblivion. This expands the supply of the currency, making it less valuable over time, deterring people from sound, long-term financial planning and saving. As covered in chapter 3, monetary expansion is a way for government authorities to steal from the community through a hidden tax, usually without representation, legislation, or transparency. The reason this theft is possible is because of the existence of a central bank, a system of money without an authority that can expand the money supply wouldn't have this problem. In other words, a moral money wouldn't have a central money printing authority. As covered in chapter 2, traditional money already existed in nature, like salt, seashells, and silver. These all have the property of decentralization or the lack of a central money creator. As long as these goods were difficult to acquire, they functioned well as money. For this reason, gold is a more moral money than paper. Central banks can always print more money and steal from the community in a fiat money system. In a gold monetary system, without any fractional reserve banking, an equivalent amount of theft would be much more difficult to pull off. Bitcoin and gold are both decentralized in a similar way. 
Unlike fiat money, there is no producer of Bitcoin, just as there is no single producer of gold. The production of Bitcoin is costly, much like the production of gold. Yet anyone with a computer can try to mine Bitcoin, just as anyone with a shovel can try to mine gold. Bitcoin is superior to gold in that the total supply of Bitcoin is already known. Bitcoin is the only money in the world that exhibits absolute scarcity. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. This differs from gold, which continues to expand in supply via mining. In 2019, NASA found an asteroid with a million times more gold than all the gold that exists in the world's vaults. If gold could be cheaply mined on such an asteroid, gold would go the way of salt or seashells and no longer be used as money. The scarcity of Bitcoin is guaranteed in a way that gold is not. Bitcoin is therefore a more just money, one that is resistant to theft by central bankers as well as technical innovations and discoveries. The predictable, transparent, and immutable immutable supply gives Bitcoin a significant advantage as it competes for the trust of the community to become a reliable store of value. Unlike government money or even gold, people know with absolute certainty that Bitcoin will never have its value compromised by an unexpected supply increase. Bitcoin's fixed supply also provides a fixed measurement of value which encourages consistent quality and disincentivizes cutting corners. Put simply, Bitcoin is non-inflatable money in a world where wealth is continuously stolen by inflation. There's more I could share with you, but I'm going to leave it at that and encourage you to read the book itself called Thank God for Bitcoin, The Creation, Corruption, and Redemption of Money. You can find it on Amazon or our bookstore, tgifbookstore.com. Also, maybe this is such a new area for you, you wouldn't know where to begin. I've been in the crypto space for about two years now, and I've seen that it's really the wild, wild west. There's a lot of scamming. There's a lot of risk. And so if you invest in Bitcoin or any type of cryptocurrency, only invest your risk capital. That risk capital is what you can afford to lose. It's not going to affect you if you were to lose it. Nobody wants to lose money, but if you're in this space, it's an emerging industry. And so it has a lot of ups and downs and regulations have not been put in place by the government and they're continually fighting it because they see Bitcoin and crypto as competition for banks. So we're in a volatile marketplace. Having said that, there are some places out there that you can do quite well without having to not have knowledge of cryptocurrencies. I'm involved in one program called uh, 818cryptoprogram.me. If you go to that website, you can watch a webinar on a program that's generating 25% return on your money. That's 818. That's 25% monthly, not yearly, but monthly. And I've been in the program several months now. And it has paid out consistently. So if that's of interest to you, go watch the webinar at the number 818cryptoprogram.me, like me, 818cryptoprogram.me. So thanks for being with me today. God bless, and I hope you have a great day.